poll numbers are mounting, but so are the barriers. Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson is here now. Time of this recording, we're just about ready to end the year 2023. Of course, the presidential primaries for election 2024 begin in just about one month, and it's with that in mind that we hope you'll hang out with us for the next half hour to allow us, among other things, to help you become a more informed voter. I am Elia Francis. As you may know, this is not Marianne Williamson's first go round. Back in January of 2020, she launched a presidential campaign that ended just about a year later. This time, though, Williamson is all in with recently rising numbers and an eye on the nation's first primary. Williamson drew initial attention in 1992 following the publication of her book, A Return to Love. It dominated the New York Times bestsellers list for 39 weeks after winning affirmation from producer and talk host Oprah Winfrey. That book, a reflection of her own experiences after reading author Helen Chuckman's A Course in Miracles, helped inspire Williamson to hold increasingly popular lectures on faith and love. She went on to become the spiritual leader for the Unity Church in Warren, Michigan, gathering more than 2,300 congregants and 50,000 local television viewers. In 2014, Williamson ran as an independent from California's 33rd Congressional District for the U.S. House. She finished fourth out of 19 candidates in the primary. Over the years, some pundits have mocked Williamson's style and policy, however many disagree with that approach. Following the July 2019 Democratic debate, Jamel Bowie, columnist for the New York Times, wrote, quote, It feels insane to say this, but Williamson outdebated virtually everyone else on the stage. She gave a compelling answer on reparations and returned again and again to the most important issue for Democratic voters, beating Donald Trump. Williamson will be back on the debate stage January 8, 2024, just two weeks before the New Hampshire primary. She'll face her Democratic challenger, Dean Phillips, in a head-to-head -head discussion of the issues in a forum that will not include President Joe Biden, who's opted to skip the New Hampshire primary. We are pleased to welcome author, activist, and 2024 Democratic presidential candidate, Marianne Williamson. Candidate Williamson, thank you for joining us here on Now. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, let's talk numbers. Your poll numbers have been um, rising as of late. Uh, if, uh, if I uh, get this correct, you're about 12%, averaging about 12% right now. And while that's still far behind uh, the Democratic leader, Joe Biden, it's been compared to the surge of Nikki Haley recently, who's also running behind her uh, GOP uh, 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 challenger, uh, Donald Trump. What do you make of this? What do you think is going on now? Well, I think in the Democratic Party, there's a great hunger uh, to hear from voices other than just Joe Biden's. And I don't think that Democrats are very appreciative of the fact that the DNC thinks it's entitled to basically make the decision um, and uh, suppress other candidates the way they have been. Mm -hmm. I think that also because the president's poll numbers are are diminishing, there is a genuine concern about whether or not he is someone who can uh, easily, we, we know he can't easily, I don't think anyone could easily, but whether he can in fact beat uh, Donald Trump in 2024. Mm -hmm. And I think that people are listening uh, to my argument uh, that we will not be able to beat Trump uh, with same old, same old politics. In order to uh, defeat the fascists, this is what uh, Ron, uh, Roosevelt said. He said that we will not have to worry about a fascist takeover in this country as long as democracy delivers on its promises. Uh, the fascists should never have gotten so close to the door. Uh, they got so close to the door because over the last 40, 50 years, democracy has not been living, delivering on its promises. And my agenda does. Universal health care, tuition-free college and tech school, subsidized child care, paid family leave, guaranteed sick pay, guaranteed affordable housing, guaranteed living wage, 
the waging peace, ending America's drug war. And I want to point out that everything that I just said to you is considered a moderate position in every other advanced democracy. Mm -hmm. We're living at a time where the majority of Republicans, as well as Democrats, not as much of a majority, but still a majority of Republicans, do want universal health care. A majority of Republicans, as well as <laughs> Democrats, want tuition-free college and tech school. Mine is the agenda that would actually defeat uh, Donald Trump by offering people so much more. Mm -hmm. Well, you, uh, conversely, Florida Democrats, Democrats in Florida have refused to put you on the ballot, along with uh, Dean Phillips. That leaves only <laughs> one candidate uh, in Florida, and the rules say that if you only have one candidate, then there won't be a Democratic primary, which is, that's crazy. That's crazy to me. How'd that happen? Uh, it happens because what in these states, and, and today, as of today, we have a problem in North Carolina. First it started in Florida, uh, then in Tennessee, and now as of today, it's problematical in uh, North Carolina as well. What's happening here is that the state secretary, the secretaries of state or the election boards in these states say to the parties, tell us who you want on your ballot. So for instance, today I attended by Zoom the election board uh, meeting in North Carolina. Okay, who do the Republicans want? The Republicans say Trump, Haley, DeSantis, Asa Hutchinson, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, I think they said Chris Christie. Okay, I mean, I don't remember that name having said, but I can't imagine it wasn't. Then they asked the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party said, Joe Biden. Now, I am an FEC certified candidate. I've been in the national news. I have to be living under a rock not to know that indeed I am running. And this is the Democratic Party seeking to suppress any candidacies but Joe Biden's. This is undemocratic. You, you don't save democracy by suppressing democracy. And candidate suppression is a form of voter suppression. Mm -hmm. This is very disturbing. It's disturbing to me as an individual, of course, but it's disturbing to me as an American. And the last place where you should see these kind of shenanigans um, is in the Democratic Party. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that you intend to do in order to, to blunt this move, which really seems like it's it's shutting out the American voter. Is there anything you it can- It absolutely is. Yeah. It absolutely is. It's not just what it's doing to me. It's saying to the voters of, of, of Florida, you're not gonna get a voice in this primary. It's saying to the voice uh, uh, voices of people in Tennessee, saying to the voters in, in um, North Carolina, if indeed, now in North Carolina, they're going to make their final decision on January 2nd. But, you know, it's interesting, you say, well, what could you do about this? See, this is how the system is so rigged. If I were to uh, uh, go ahead with a legal challenge in Florida, that would be an estimated $75,000. When, when, when you talk legal challenge, you mean like a, a lawsuit or the credentials challenge or are okay, those two so separate is, things? Yeah. So this is the deal. The question becomes, well, who, who's, who's at fault here? Is it the uh, Secretary of State in, in Florida or is it the Democratic Party? You know, there's been an issue ever since 2016 when some uh, Bernie Sanders supporters at the end of that race, they did take the DNC to court for what they claimed to have been an undemocratic suppression of Bernie's candidacy. The DNC argued that they're, hey, they're a private corporation. And so they don't owe it to people uh, to make it a fair election. Our argument, the argument of many people in this country, is that even though technically they are not a government agency, they are t performing a role, a quasi-governmental function, mm. and therefore they have a responsibility to the common good. They have a responsibility to the people of the United States. So, uh, you know, you, you could argue the constitutionality of the fact that the state is even handing it over to the parties. You could uh, argue it on a constitutional basis in terms of what I just described. But either way, when it comes down to practicalities, even then, if, if, so what are you going to do? You're going to spend $75,000 of campaign funds on Florida or on, um, and on, on Tennessee and on North Carolina? Now, first of all, my campaign does not have those kinds of resources. Even if the campaign had those kind of resources, my concern now is that this is a pattern. It's not just about Florida. It's also about Tennessee. It's also about North Carolina. And uh, the fact that they are seeking to do this in state after state after state is very worrisome. I mean, if, if we cannot assume that, that we have, I mean, how can you say we have free elections if you don't have free candidate selection. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's very concerning.
there are concerns. Kurt, you, you mentioned that um, there's possibly at the convention that could be a credentials challenge to this if this continues. Oh. How does that work? Are you talking, oh. did you just say something about the Democratic the, Party convention? Yes, the credentials challenge. Uh, challenging their credentials, the credentials of the uh, uh, of, of the electors uh, of the, Dem you know, of the right of delegates. Now, I'm sorry. Right. Well, even that is an issue. If so, Florida law says that if there's only one person on the ballot, that then basically you've you've canceled your primary. So certainly we would challenge it if Joe Biden then said that those delegates are his, because we'd say, well, then nobody gets any delegates. In terms of challenges at the party convention, we're not. We're not that far down the road yet. We're just, I'm on the ballot in over 20 states. Um, and I don't think the average American has any idea how hard it is to get on these ballots. Mm -hmm. And as, as I was saying, this, the situation is designed um, in order that only people either with access to huge amounts of money or access to people who have huge amounts of money can get anywhere near the pinnacles of power. And so then you wonder, you know, whether you're talking about health care, whether you're talking about college costs, whether you're talking about child care, you ask yourself, well, why is it that so many of our policies represent a, a complete lack of, uh, of concern for the economic anxiety that a majority of Americans experience on a daily basis? But when you see how this works, you're not surprised at all, because the only people who tend to even be able to get in there are people who are so far removed from those realities, so emotionally buffered. Um, so I really feel I'm in the belly of a very corrupt beast here. Um, and um, right now, we're, we're, we're not even close to the issue of challenging credentials at the convention. Right now, we're just getting on the ballots that we can get on. Gotcha. We're not there yet. We'll uh, probably have to revisit that at some point or another. You, Dean Phillips, who we've also had on this program, uh, Jen Huger, were all, uh, who were all kept off the ballot there. Um, uh, called the decision anti-democratic. Eden Giannorio, the communications director for the Democratic Party in Florida, uh, claims the party was simply following the rules, saying, quote, I think what would be anti-democratic would be us bending the rules for latecomers. Bending That's the rules for late. Yeah. yeah this is, first of all, I don't think I'm late. I, I announced in March. <laughs> I announced in March, so I'm hardly a latecomer. And uh, what they do is they'll put something on a website that you don't even know is there, and then they remove it real quickly. Uh, what happened with this particular uh, vote is that at their convention, they had an executive committee and they said, who's running? Uh, we nominate Joe Biden and everyone went, yay. And then they said, well, anybody else? <laughs> and nobody was there. You know, we didn't even know. Um, so surprise, yeah, surprise. Yeah, surprise. Crazy. Now, you're on the ballot uh, for the New Hampshire primary, which, coming, which is coming up, if uh, uh, memory serves, January 23rd. Uh, so that's the first one, uh, despite the Democratic Party's move to do otherwise. <coughs> um, right now, Biden's at 65%. You and uh, 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 Phillips are roughly running at about 10%. But Biden's not even on the ballot. He's not even on the ballot. So a lot of people, they say, would write him in. What, what's your strategy there in New Hampshire, which is coming up soon? Well, I'm in New Hampshire right now. I'm talking to you from Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, the only strategy is talking to people as best you can. But as you probably know, you said something earlier that re referred to it. I've been quite invisibilized uh, in the mainstream media. Uh, you mentioned before that when uh, Nikki Haley has the numbers that I have, it's called a surge. Mm. Uh, with, with me, uh, uh, ignore her. by all means, um, which I don't think is very democratic. And I think it's a real transgression of journalistic responsibility myself. Um, but when you're not on uh, the, the mainstream media, now I have, I'm at over 32% among Gen Z. 
D. Well, the reason I'm at over 32% among Gen Z and Democrats is because I can get to them on the internet. I mean, I can get to them on TikTok. It doesn't cost me anything. Mm -hmm. But if you're not on some of these other mainstream channels, then it's very difficult. And in my case, the issue is that people just don't even know that my campaign exists. Mm -hmm. um, so then that, of course, suppresses your fundraising capacity because people aren't going to send you money if they don't even know you're there, which then decreases your capacity to compensate for the, for the invisibilization and the erasure. So when you ask me, how do I account for the fact that we have had some good polling numbers? I account for by the fact that once people do hear this campaign, this campaign is the one that's aligned with the will of the majority of Democratic voters. This campaign, in my agenda, is the one that's uh, um, aligned with the will of the majority of the American people. That's why this campaign is the one that would win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I be the first in the country? Maybe we'll be the first in the country here. This, what she's doing, is a surge. That's a surge. So there, we've gone ahead. <laughs> made it official. Let's thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Certified. 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 Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Certified by now. What the hell? So uh, <laughs> let's switch our uh, hats for a second. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin in Israel this week uh, in the latest attempt to get the IDF to wind down the war in Gaza. He and others in the administration have been trying to do this balancing act where they're trying to make that urgent message uh, of stopping the war, winding it down, stopping all this killing. Uh, and pairing that with their continued unflagging support for not, not Israel, not the country, not um, the citizens, but the government of the state of Israel. As president, how would you approach this? I do not believe that Netanyahu is good for Israel. I don't believe that he's good for the region. I don't believe that this war has done much more than just create a lot more hate. And I did appreciate on October 7th, I appreciated the president's clarity, his moral clarity. And his sincerity on that was obvious and I appreciated it. The next morning he said that he would meet with Jewish Americans, which I certainly would have done. But I would have also met later that day with Arab Americans, uh, particularly Palestinian Americans. Our alliance, highest alliance should be with humanity itself. Uh, some American presidents have tried. I think the American president who really had this right, particularly in his post-presidency, was Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. As president, I would have been a lot more vocal <clears throat> and a lot more adamant that the settlements are illegal, that the, um, <clears throat> that the uh, occupation of the West Bank is illegal, uh, that the siege of, of um, Gaza is unacceptable, and so forth. Um, Obviously, a strong support of Israel is important, but so should a strong support of the Palestinian people as well. It's also important to remember that the, not every Palestinian is Hamas and not every Israeli is Netanyahu. But as president, uh, you would not have seen me hugging Netanyahu. Uh, and although the American president doesn't get to determine uh, who the Israeli prime minister is, uh, I think it would be a very loud, um, to be honest, I've got some I can only imagine some of the conversations that are going on even now behind the scenes. Um, I do not see Netanyahu's policy, certainly not given what he's doing in Gaza now, but even his entire attitude about this. Uh, I think it's been bad for Israel, bad, obviously bad for Palestinians and potentially very bad for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm quite disappointed, if not surprised, at the inability of the Palestinian uh, uh, authority. Um, and I, I hesitate there because I remember them as the PLO. I think many people do, but as the Palestinian Authority back as the PLO, um, they had great um, say over what happened to Palestinians. And there was at times uh, uh, a, a good effort, a successful effort in, at times to resolve the situation. Their influence in the region has diminished greatly from what I read. And I wonder who who would who would step forward. There's nobody stepping forward now in the Arab nations. Saudi Arabia, uh, is uh, 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 Egypt, um, Jordan, any of the other countries to try and help replace Hamas in Gaza and help give the Palestinian people what they need, what they want going forward, which is uh, their own state. Well, I'm not sure I totally agree that no one is stepping forward. They release hostages, uh, the hostages that have been released. Obviously, those were deals that were brokered by Qatar. 
Mm -hmm. um, Jordan has been vocal. The King uh, of Jordan has been vocal. Egypt has been vocal. Uh, this is going to have to be an international consortium that steps up now, uh, particularly uh, comprised of Arab nations, as you mentioned. I don't think that they've exactly been quiet. But they, if I were the American president, I would be seeking to harness that consortium. You've got Egypt, Jordan, UAE, <clears throat> Qatar. Um, like I said, I don't think they've been quiet. But remember, they have a lot at stake, too. Yeah. They don't want this to turn into a regional war. And the last thing any of them want is for, the, for Iran to get involved. Um, but I think that... I think that at this point, it is going to have to be an international consortium that comes together to create the architecture for a two-state solution. I don't see how anything else will be um, uh, a way forward at this time. Yeah. You say as president, you'd move the uh, U.S. Embassy back to Tel Aviv. Uh, of course, Donald Trump just moved it in like a week or so. Uh, to put us in a more neutral position, as you describe it, if I'm correct there. <clears throat> is that possible? With Net That's not possible. Well, yeah, the president. Listen. It's, it's actually a performative action, but it's an important performative action. And that's the thing about moving it. I mean, look, the Knesset's in Jerusalem, so that's just the thing. It is in Jerusalem. But by, the, by President Trump moving the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the embassy, he was sticking his finger in the eye of the Palestinians. Uh, because he knows darn well that that is an issue. You know, Jerusalem being the capital is an issue. This is one of the areas where I know for me, and I think for many people, there was the assumption, not just the hope, but the assumption. And there are several issues like this. Julian Assange is an issue. Cuba is an issue. This is just one of quite a few issues where we assumed that, that uh, Biden would reverse some Trump policies, go back to Obama policies, and he didn't. So absolutely, if I were president, we would skedaddle that embassy back to Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. You also suggested, and you just, you just mentioned it a few minutes ago, uh, the, the way to ultimately, way to end this conflict is to reopen talks on the two-state solution. Is that actually possible right now to, before we end the war, or at least wind it down significantly? what's going to be different? And, and what, what, when you say wind it down successfully, so much hatred has been created. How anything that happens could be called success. So I, don't, I, I think one of the things that has the world up in arms, what is the goal here? What is the goal here? So winding it up successfully, I don't even know what that phrase means. I think it'll wind up because hopefully, whether it's Lloyd Austin being there, delivering a message from Biden, somebody's got to say, stop this. Stop this. Um, there's, you know, Israel is saying it doesn't want to have a two-state solution. That's really terrible for us. But at this point, there are a lot of people who are, who have a lot at stake here besides just Israel and mm -hmm. uh, besides uh, just the, the Palestinians. The, 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 you know, the, on one hand, people say, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say the Israel government. I like to make that distinction. When, yes, when, thank you. When we thank talk you. And about I like Israel. to make that distinction right, too. So it, thank you very, very much for that. Yes. No, as yes. you know, it's not the people. Um, Yes, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, and you're so correct there. Many people say that the two-state solution is, is dead. My response to that is, well, let's resurrect it. Because what is the alternative? The alternative is a one-state solution. Now, I've certainly heard many people recently talking about a one-state solution, but to me, who's gonna govern that one state? <laughs> who's gonna govern that? And if ever there was a setup for a bloody civil war, yeah. These people are, are trying to kill each other when they're not even on the same piece of land. So you're going to throw them all together, huh? <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Like War of the Roses, sir. No, no moss. Hey, Donald Trump has pretty much told us what his second administration is going to be like. Uh, he's talked about these detention camps he intends to build with uh, Stephen Miller, I guess, uh, to uh, uh, detain uh, uh, immigrants and brown people and, and then throw them out of the country. Who knows what he's going to do with the detention camps once he's thrown them out of the country. He's uh, um, talked about being a dictator for one day uh, and uh, used language that's directly from Mein Kampf, Adolf, Adolf Hitler, vermin. He's referred to those people as vermin. And he uh, he said that those same people poison the blood of the nation. Uh, it's clear to some that we may be falling headlong into fascism. That said, how accurate is the notion that the issues of this election 
are no longer policy-based, but instead our last effort to avoid a repeat of 1939 Nazi Germany here in America? Well, obviously both. You know, we've been hearing for a long time about elections being the most important of our lifetime. I think this election is one of the most important in American history. And for the very reasons that you said, the man is literally quoting Mein Kampf. Yeah. This is not figurative or metaphorical that he's acting like a fascist. He is giving us fascist talking points. And if anything has become clear now, he says what he means. There's no reason to disbelieve him. And uh, his policies are indeed fascist. And you were talking about Stephen Miller before. Um, and this is not an original thing for me to point out, but mm -hmm. it has been said, and I think correctly, that last time he had people with some semblance of respect for the Constitution who were surrounding him and restrained him in, how, in whatever possible ways they could. This time he realizes, oh, I don't have to do that. Everybody around me could be a Sebastian Gorka or a Stephen Miller. Yeah. And um, if if you're not if you're not terrified by that, you're not listening. You're not looking. So there is no doubt about it. We absolutely must win the election in 2024. Mm -hmm. We must win the election in 2024. Yeah, the stakes are so high, so high, as you've said before, and we've said right here on the stream. Uh, let's do a, a bit of a lightning round because I said before we want to educate our uh, our uh, our listeners and our viewers uh, about what it is you would do if you were president um, for not, not just for a day, but <clears throat> certainly for two terms, hopefully. Um, let's talk. Tackle some of the issues that uh, that uh, you would like to tackle as president. Gun reform. I'm beginning to think that even if the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress, we still couldn't get comprehensive gun control passed. Um, how would you handle it? Well, it depends on who they are. You know, they're Democrats and then they're Democrats. If it's a Democrat named Joe Manchin, then no. If it's a Democrat named uh, Kirsten Sinema, I think we've learned that. Um, it, it's not just any Democrat. So uh, if you have uh, the Democrats in control of the House and the Senate and the White House, then it's people who are intent on overriding the nefarious influence of the NRA, then yes, we'll get an assault weapon ban. We had an assault weapon ban once before. Another thing, you know, when I mentioned before that the majority of Republicans as well as, Amer as Democrats want universal health care and tuition-free uh, tax um, uh, college and tech school, the majority of Republicans as well as Democrats, including gun owners, do want common sense gun safety laws, right. do want universal uh, red flag laws, do want the background checks, universal background checks, do want the closing of the loopholes, uh, the high capacity magazines, etc. You know, this is one area out of many where the American people and the will of the American people is not the problem. The problem we have is that our leaders uh, routinely do more to serve uh, the profit maximization goals of their donors than the express will of their own constituents. And the power that the NRA has in Washington, uh, the gun lobby, the, the billions of dollars spent by the um, gun manufacturing industry to nefariously influence our, our leaders. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a legalized system of legalized bribery in Washington. And uh, that's the problem, not only on the issue of guns, but on the issue of so much else as well. Yeah. You, you support a single payer Medicare system for, for our <coughs> healthcare system. How, how does that work? I, I, I think I've heard about that before, but how does that work? We already have Medicare. You just make it Medicare for all. We have a program that works. Now there are many, there are many uh, systems from England to Germany to Australia to New Zealand. All of them are somewhat different. The important thing to remember is that every other advanced democracy plus other advanced nations have universal health care. The American people need to realize that on this, level, this issue, as on so many, we've simply been played. The issue is not that it's complicated. The issue is that it is corrupt. So we already have Medicare. We already have the basic template. And uh, it's time for us to have Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. We have one in four Americans living with medical debt. 18 million Americans who cannot afford to pay for their prescriptions that their doctors give them. Uh, 1.3 million Americans who are rationing their insulin 
uh, 85 million Americans who are underinsured or uninsured. You know, with a lot of people, they can afford to go to the doctor. They can't afford to pay for the tests that the doctor wants. Right. They can't yeah. afford to pay for the uh, for the operations. You have people in this country who are putting GoFundMe pages on the internet for life-saving operations for themselves and their children. You have this in no other advanced country. Mm -hmm. And we have 68,000 Americans every year who die from lack of health care. So when people say, how can we afford to pay for it? How can we afford not to? People are paying for the current situation with their lives. Mm -hmm. Talk about your economic bill of rights, if you would. <clears throat> the economic bill of rights, uh, Franklin Roosevelt wrote an economic bill of rights, which contained his plans for what would happen uh, when the war was over. And of course, he, he died shortly uh, before it was. Uh, the uh, economic bill of rights sort of brought into the 21st century is uh, my, my architecture. Uh, for a plan for fundamental economic reform. Universal health care, tuition-free college and tech school. Let's cancel the college loan debts. That's another thing which is deeply wrong, deeply predatory, and should yeah. never have even occurred. Subsidize child care, uh, paid family leave, uh, guaranteed housing, guaranteed access to affordable housing, uh, guaranteed sick pay, and a guaranteed living wage. Mm -hmm. How would we you... need to make an economic U-turn in this country? We have 62% of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck. The level of economic anxiety out there that is expressed, mental health crisis, drug addiction, suicide rate, violent, you, you, uh, under, there's this cancer underlying all the other issues, and that's the extreme economic anxiety that has replaced what used to be a thriving middle class. And yet the Biden administration shows us uh, numbers weekly uh, or monthly. We just had the uh, uh, one of the best days on Wall Street, uh, although that doesn't always translate to individual people. About a week ago, um, um, interest rates are expected to be cut sometime next year. Other indicators as well. But people don't feel it in their day to day life. No, they don't because How does that all, everything, the, the, I'll tell you how it happens. The data that you just described uh, is relates to 20% of us. Mm. Hey, for 20% of us, things are doing well. The problem is that 20%, it's like we're living on an island and we're surrounded by a sea and that sea is filled with vast uh, economic despair. Mm -hmm. People are not stupid. It's, it's not just that they don't feel it. It's not their practical experience. So you're going to tell people you'll feel it within 10 years, therefore vote for me again? <laughs> yeah, tough one. This is a president who said that he would veto a Medicare for all bill. This is a president who said uh, that he would raise the minimum wage. Now, he did raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour for federal workers. But when it came to trying to put it further into the COVID relief bill, he was stopped by the parliamentarian. Now, this is the thing. No Republican president allows himself to be stopped by the parliamentarian. Mm. When the parliamentarian, who has no ultimate political power, tried to stop George Bush, George Bush fired the parliamentarian. So there were people who stood in line for hours hoping that they would uh, get a higher minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You think they're going to do that again? So <laughs> or, or codified, there were no codified voting rights? Yeah, you think yeah. people are going to do that again, do you? Mm, well, so I, I think that the, there's a lot of um, delusion on the part of some traditional Democrats yeah. um, to be following along with the DNC's. Uh, pro they're propo you know, they act like we got this. Uh, I don't think they got this. If they got this, Trump would never have been president. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, how would you go about reforming our admittedly broken immigration system? Well, first of all, if Congress had done its job over the last uh, decades, things would be very different. But I think we need to look at root causes. Uh, my, entire, uh, my entire outlook on all of these things moves from just treating symptoms of our problems to actually treating root causes. And in order to treat root, treat root causes, uh, which is what must be done to have any kind of permanent or even fundamental solution to this. We have to recognize what drives so many people uh, to come here to begin with. Mm -hmm. And there are two main categories, economic despair and the violence that is perpetrated by the drug cartels. Now, when it comes to the economic destabilization of so many of these countries, if you actually look at American foreign policy over the last few decades, we had our own hand in it. 
And some of those things continue to this day. We need to remove the sanctions on Cuba. We need to remove the sanctions on Venezuela, both of which contribute to the horrifying economic suffering of so many people in those countries, which ironically then makes them try to immigrate to the United States. That's not the only reason why the sanctions in, in Cuba are so wrong, but it's certainly uh, the reason why it would be helpful to remove them in terms of the crisis at the border. Mm -hmm. The second category, of course, has to do with the horrifying violence uh, uh, perpetrated by the drug cartels. And one of the main agenda items on my platform is uh, the end to America's drug war. Our uh, war on drugs actually helps hand the drug cartels their market, take away their black market. It won't solve the entire problem, but we could go far towards putting a real dent in, in, the, um, uh, in, in, in the power of the drug cartels. Sure. The next issue, I'm sorry. No, 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 go, go ahead, on. go ahead, go ahead, finish. The next issue is how racist the whole thing is. If this was 150 years ago, uh, keep out the Jews, keep out the Polish, uh, keep out the Irish. Yeah. And uh, a lot of this is just uh, pure racism. If you look at the, at the actual facts, when you take the immigrant population that comes into the United States, statistically, if you help people integrate, find a place here, within a year, the vast majority are uh, self-sufficient. And if you look at the immigrant population as a whole, you're talking about a contribution. Uh, and not a suck on the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So what the Democratic Party should be doing, instead of acting on the defense with such things as the president actually building more wall, we should be creating a genuine counter narrative uh, to the unbelievable racism of Governor um, Governor uh, Greg Abbott in Texas. He's just your modern version of a racist cop. That's all he is. Yeah, That's yeah. all he is. And I, I recently went down to uh, Eagle Pass, Texas. Uh, also, you know, remember when Biden took office and Kamala Harris was going to go down there. Well, let me tell you, you fly into San Antonio and you drive an hour. It's not hard. <laughs> so what an Eagle Pass, what, what a, a local official told me, he said, we feel oppressed by the state government and we feel abandoned by the federal government. Nobody wants to fix it because everybody's playing. Well, we know why the GOP doesn't. But the Dem this is another place where the Geo uh, Democratic Party continues to uh, play to this mythical center rather than doing the right thing and saying, you know what, these are good people. Now, do we have some security issues? Of course we do. But if, if you look at the, um, uh, the crime rates uh, in this country, far more crimes are committed by people who are born here mm -hmm. than by people who are coming here. Yeah. And, uh, we do have to uh, have security measures, but uh, there are people who know how to do that, and yeah. it could be done. You mentioned Ka Kamala Harris. Wasn't she supposed to take this as part of uh, her mission to uh, to go down there? And I think I've only yeah. seen her there once. And okay, I'm willing to admit. And, and what did she say when she went there? Her message was, "Don't yeah. come." Yeah, I know. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. I think we're both started. Yeah, we already did. Hey, last question. <laughs> I think we're kind of, I think we're started. Yeah, we're started. We got to finish this somewhere. Hey, last question. Earlier this year, um, the White House spokesperson marked you with comment referencing your work at, and, and writings as a spiritual leader. What do you make of those attacks and how, how, how has it affected or how did it not affect your candidacy? Well, first of all, you said she was referring to my work. Mm -hmm. No, she wasn't. She was referring to a caricature, a false narrative about my work. She said something about a uh, crystal ball. I've written 15 books, no crystal balls in there, given thousands of lectures, no crystal balls. So uh, when President Biden took office, you might remember that uh, he made a comment, I think his first day in office, uh, that if anyone on his staff showed disrespect to anyone, they would be gone in a day. So that's the first thing I want to say. Yeah. Secondly, has it affected has it affected my um, campaign? You better believe it. She's a crystal lady. She's kooky. She's crazy. The stories, the smears. Um, it's tough. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough because it. I think that most people, and I'll just say this, uh, because I'm not acting uh, as an anchor, so I can I can uh, bleed my opinion here because this is mine. Um, I think when I talk to most people, 
they know that your heart is in it. Um, and these people continue to fight against that. So, you know, I think we hope and pray that uh, your message gets through and we can Thank get you. past all that that nonsense because your 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 heart's you. in it your heart's in it and yeah Thank okay you. yeah i mean lack of experience and uh, please um jimmy carter didn't know jack about going into the presidency when we elected him back in the mid-70s well, this well is you possible. know first of all thank you mm -hmm. second of all this experience issue uh basically those forces would argue that only someone qualified to be president, but their idea of qualified is qualified to perpetuate and maintain the system as it is. My qualification is in disrupting unjust systems. And uh, we don't need another technocrat. We need a visionary. The problem is not that we don't have car mechanics. The problem is we're on the wrong road. I'm not the greatest visionary in America, but I'm the only one running for the Democratic nomination. For that matter, I want to point out something else. Donald Trump was not experienced. The problem was not that he was not experienced. The problem is his character. Mm -hmm. If he had wanted to surround himself with capable, um, high-minded Republicans, he could have. Um, this had to do with who he is as a person. Yeah, absolutely. Candidate Marianne Williamson, uh, I've taken up more time than I promised, but I thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank all, you. The best, all the best in the upcoming primaries. Thank you very, very much. I so appreciate it. And thank you for being there. Remember, tell your friends about us. Then like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and come back next week for another edition of Now. Till then, take care. Peace.